Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, so today I'm joined by John McCafferty and I have to get these the right way around. So John is currently the CSO and founder of IONTAS and the CEO and founder of Maxian Therapeutics, which are both companies based in Cambridge, UK. And the nod there reassures me that I got that right, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> thank you for joining us today, John. So John was the winner of our um, Life Sciences Inspiration of the Year Award, which was presented last week at our Building Life Science Adventures Careers Conference. So I'm delighted to be joined today by John, and I'm really looking forward to kind of unraveling um, some of his amazing achievements and some fantastic stories. Um, throughout his career journey. So thank you so much, John, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to hand you over to John now, and he's going to very briefly introduce himself, and we will dive in. Thank you, John. Okay, well, thank you. Well, first of all, I should say um, I'm, I'm honoured and very happy to have, have received the award. You know, I, I have to say a little voice in my head asks, um, you know, th this is the first award I've ever won, and a little voice is, uh, is saying, um, is this the end? You know, am I finished now? You know, but uh, but hopefully not. And and I do thank uh, everyone at One New Place for the award and the people who voted for me. It's uh, very much an honour. Um, so yeah, my name's John McCafferty. I'm from Glasgow, as you might tell from the accent, from the Gorbals in Glasgow. Uh, not a place that's got a, a big history of producing scientists, but I guess scientists are pretty well distributed. So there's not many villages you can say are full of scientists, unless it's Cambridge. Um, but anyway, I, I guess science was not really kind of part of the sort of uh, the, the history, if you like, of, of where I came from. But it's something I always enjoyed. And um, I did my degree at Strathclyde University in biochemistry, pharmacology and uh, PhD in Glasgow. So in that respect, like uh, I think like many Glaswegians who end up staying, staying in the hometown to, to do stuff. Um, but then I reached a point, you know, after the PhD where I thought, you know, I really should leave Glasgow, you know. So it wasn't I had a burning desire to leave, but I thought if I want to get anywhere in science, I need to uh, at least have left for a period and you know I'll I'll probably come back. But of course that never happened. Life takes over and the, the journey uh, the, the journey goes on. So um yeah I, and I did a postdoc in London and eventually moved in made the first jump into industry when I went to work at Amersham International, was there for a number of years. And eventually I spotted uh, Dave Chiswell's group across the corridor doing this cool antibody engineering work. At that time, it was CDR grafting or humanization of antibodies and actually requested to, to join that. And then, um, and that was great for six months until the company announced that they were closing corporate research. And so that kind of put the, the cat among the pigeons and in many ways was the kind of impetus to to start Cambridge Antibody Technology. So. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, John. Um, now, Cambridge Antibody Technologies, can you tell me a little bit more about that and that kind of journey to becoming co-founder um, yep. of, of a company? Um, and also, while still being principal scientist, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So as I say, the, I was in Davis Antibody Engineering Group. Um, I remember one day I was, I was being off the next day and uh, I could see all the project leaders were huddling in offices and there was a, a staff meeting announced the next day and I got, got the sniff that something was going on. So uh, I, I, Dave kind of then told me what was, what was coming, uh, that they, they were going to close down corporate research. And the immediately the conversation was try about trying to keep this group together, either moving on mass or forming a subsidiary or a brand new company. And immediately I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm up for that. So, um, and I very deliberately didn't apply for any jobs during that period. And all the other people in the group did and eventually left until in the end it was just Dave and I left standing. And uh, we'd kind of been in contact with Greg Winter in Cambridge, so a bit of an antibody guru. And that, that's really what led to uh, the formation of Cambridge Antibody Technology in Cambridge, which involved uh, me working for the the first five or six months in Greg's lab down at the LMB and, and Dave uh, working from home. And, uh, so it, it maybe wasn't such a common thing at the, at the time with the, the working from home thing. Um, and that was it, then eventually moved to labs in Babraham and, and off we went. And by the end of the first year, I had a first author um, nature publication describing uh, for the first time uh, antibody phage display, the, the nub of which was we showed that we could take an antibody gene insert it into the genome of a filamentous bacteriophage, basically a virus that infects bacteria. And we could do that in such a way 
that the encoded antibody was presented on the outside with the encoding gene on the inside. So we created a tiny package that um, like genotype and phenotype, if you like. And we were able to do that in a system that allowed us to do it on a massive scale. So we ended up building uh, antibody libraries with 40 billion members from which we could then go in and use the binding properties of the antibody to pull out the encoding gene. Um, it was a great success. We, we generated patents on that. Uh, in the first year or two, uh, we were contacted by an ex-colleague of Dave, a uh, guy Bob Kamen at BSF, who had the idea of making a TNF neutralizing antibody as a fast follow-up for some of the drugs that were already moving through the clinic. And so we generated the, uh, the molecule that went on to become Humira, which is still the world's biggest selling drug and has been for the last five or six years. So that was a great kickstart to our little company. And then eventually my co-inventor, Greg Winter, won the Nobel Prize for antibody phage display a couple of years ago. So uh, it couldn't have got any better, could it? <laughs> no, that is amazing. That is, is, is so impressive. Now, after CAT was acquired by AstraZeneca, you made the decision to return to academia. Now, I know this isn't something that's really uncommon, but what made you make that decision? What made you want to go back? Yeah, so yeah. I had left before uh, the acquisition, but I, I was running a project for AstraZeneca. So I guess you could say we were dating uh, during <laughs> that period. Um, and, uh, but for me, I, I was always driven by the science, um, very much a scientist, lo love of science. Um, and, you know, I, I learned a huge amount in IONTAS, met lots of fantastic people, made some big realizations that actually it's not all just about scientists in the lab and on the bench, although hugely important as that is, but there's all sorts of other professionals that you work with that are all necessary to, to make a successful company. Um, so um, anyway, it, it was a fantastic time and a fantastic period, but I was always driven by a love of science. And um, I, actually I was on a train coming up from London when I, I met John Sulston on the train who was head of the, the Sanger Centre. Um, and I kind of chatted to him and I said, so what's, you know, what's going to happen to the Sanger Centre once you've sequenced the human genome? You know, there only being one human genome, of course, as we might have thought at the time. Um, and his answer was that he expected it to turn into genome centre. And, um, and so um, Alan Bradley eventually took over as director and probably within a month of his arrival, he had my CD on the desk. Um, so it was really a motivation to just try and get back to some more, more basic science actually. And, and so, yeah, I moved to the, the Sanger Institute and ran a group there for five years. And yeah, it was a fantastic time. And again, a fantastic experience. Amazing. So what happened next? So you left, after you were in academia, you then decided to start your own company, and that was IONTAS. Okay, there's a step in between that. So uh, the, the, uh, they end up, uh, despite getting a fantastic review, this, the, this, the, insti the Sanger decided to, to drop proteomics, which is a territory that I was in. Um, but I negotiated to be able to take money and equipment and people to the University of Cambridge and I ran a group there for another five years. So during that period after CAT, um, I spent 10 years on grant funding in academia, uh, continuing to work on antibody phage display. Uh, the Sanger is very much about high th developing a high throughput platform and embedding informatics and uh, imaging of tissue sections and so on into, and creating a, a sort of database there. By the time we went to the university, it was much more of a typical drug discovery type approach with individual targets, individual molecules seeking uh, blocking functional activity. But again, during that period, I'd say we honed our skills further. Um, and so when the, the funding came to an end at the, the biochemistry department, uh, that again helped us launch um, came, uh, IONTAS. Um, so yeah, there was a kind of worrying period, I would say, when the um, I, I could see this funding cliff coming up. So I have to say that I've, I've um, maybe been a bit cavalier around risk or longevity. I've, you know, I was happy to jump into these pr projects that had a five-year lifetime, but with the knowledge that it, it may come to an end. But it did feel quite uncomfortable in the middle of that period of biochemistry because I thought I was going to get a, a position there that never came. And as the, 
the clock ticks, you can see the cliff, the cliff edge coming up. So that's what made me decide at that point that I, I could start a company offering antibody drug discovery services. I could see that anyone that knew what they were doing in this area had already been acquired, like um, CAT had been acquired by um, AstraZeneca, Domantis by GSK, Morphosis had morphed into its own drug discovery. So I saw an opportunity for a company uh, uh, that was nimble and could get on and do stuff. Um, and I had a great team of people around me. So I was able to negotiate with uh, Gerard Evans, the then head of department, that I could set up a company within the university for two years. And uh, we were off the ground. So we finished on a, a Friday as, um, as academics and I came in on Monday morning and signed our first contract and handed out a few job offer letters and then just lay down in the darkened room for the rest of the day. It was pretty <laughs> pretty close actually, you know, but, but that got us going. We had a single project that uh, allowed me to, to pay for three people to, to carry on. And then we, we just grew it from there. Business development was basically waiting for the telephone to ring. So people approached us. And again, this is the benefit of those days at Cambridge Antibody Technology. Most of our business in the, the beginning was people that I'd worked with there or who had recommended me uh, to other people. And so, so that was it, we were off. and. Um, and and uh, the company was born, uh, Ion Task was born, and we again we sort of grew organically, and then eventually reached a point where I could see that I was going to be the the rate limiting factor around business development, and we we brought in a business development person and kind of transitioned uh, to a company of about thirty people over about five six years. Uh, we ran about forty five projects for about twenty different companies, and we were successful with every one of them. A record we're very proud of. Uh, we, in terms of delivering what we said we would, when we said we would do it. Amazing, and thank you for sharing those experiences. Something that I find really interesting just about speaking to you is the way you talk about how you've transitioned between these these roles. You make it almost sound and. Uh, I'm probably not using the right word here, but almost like effortless. Like you just take these new opportunities on the chin and you, it's just it's just happened and things have just fit into place. Um, so that's something that I, I really kind of enjoy. Yeah, I have to say that, that there's, there's probably a couple of big moves in my life. And, and that rather than being, you could maybe say rather than a jump, they were an assisted jump in so far as uh, Amersham, the things were closing down behind and that kind of gave the push uh, for Cambridge Antibody Technology and I found myself in a position at the university where funding was running out and that kind of pushed me to 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 get on with the the cats let's uh, say the ion task stuff so many companies I get confused <laughs> oh funny um so ion task now I have to say I don't have a scientific background and something that I've always found really interesting is um how people would come up with these names, not only for new drugs and uh, new technologies, but also new companies. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about why IONTAS is named IONTAS? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting story. So uh, a number of years ago, Ian Chambers in Edinburgh uh, discovered the gene Nanog, it's a stem, an important stem cell gene, at least he was one of the people who discovered that. Um, and I learned that he came up with a name from the Gaelic language, so like Tiernanog means land of eternal youth, and I thought, what a cool name for a stem cell gene. And I thought, if I'm ever going to name a company, I'm going to do that, I'm going to take it from the Gaelic language. My parents come from Donegal, in an area that still speaks Gaelic, and so when it came time to come up with a name, my, my branding budget was four nine, four pound ninety nine at WH Smiths for a Gaelic dictionary. And I basically flicked through it looking for, a, and I thought an obscure language, you know, there'll be words in there that sound good on the ear. So I flicked through it and I found a couple of words, but I liked ion task because it had the word iron in it. And, and in fact, the proper pronunciation is Eden task, but never mind. I thought nobody's <laughs> going to get that right. So we pronounced ion task. I had the word iron in it and I had a, a goal that we would eventually do something with iron channels, even back then at the founding of, um, of ion task. So, so yeah, it's uh, the idea that we would come up with and I could find a good word from uh, the Gaelic dictionary. I have to say, I tried the same trick again with Maxion. So that was a different story. Um, and uh, in the end up, I, 
I, I couldn't find anything that worked and, and I had a gun to the head because we were we were selling the company and I needed to create the new company to receive assets and so on. So but anyway, that was it. They, I was inspired by <laughs> uh, by Ian and the Brilliant. of names in the, in the Gaelic language. Amazing. Thanks, John. So, I mean, we know that these kind of achievements and things like that, they're all kind of driven by being surrounded by really amazing people. So can you tell me, have you ever had like distinct role models and mentors throughout your career? Uh, yes, I, I would say my career got off to a pretty slow start, to be honest. It was, it was pretty... Uh, pretty nondescript, I think, up to the point of the formation of CAT. Yeah, I did PhD, did post a postdoc and so on, worked in Anderson for a short while. But for me, a, a huge transformation in my approach and outlook, outlook and aspiration was when I went to the LMD labs in Cambridge. So um, there, there's all these, this history of all these Nobel Prize winners and you go up to the coffee room and there's like three of them around the room, you know, there's Erin Klug, Cesar Milstein, Max Perutz and so on. So even though I didn't have great interactions with those, although I, I, you could speak to all of them, I think just being in that place and just being with all the other people who sort of absorbed the culture and so on, um, that was a, a sea change for me. Uh, also, I was in Greg Winter's lab and, you know, uh, Greg was a great inspiration for me and many other uh, scientists, many of whom have also gone on to set up companies and so on. Um, so those those were um, highlights, I would say. But I would also say um, during the time at Cambridge Antibody Technology, as I mentioned earlier, you're surrounded by all sorts of um, experts or in different areas. Um, you know, Dave Cheswell uh, was, you know, a great leader there, you know, fairly understated sort of guy. And he just let people flourish and grow and, and so on. So he wasn't, you know, not, not necessarily dominant and sitting on top of you but he created a, an environment where people could grow and then also I've just been inspired by the people who worked uh, uh, worked with me or for me and just their outlook and approach and, and many of those have gone on to to great things as well Jane Osborne worked in my group for a while we were uh, I was involved with early recruitment Kevin Johnson who's gone on to uh, you know um, I, 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 I shouldn't start naming names because there's too many of them and I'm going to miss important okay. people out yeah Thank you, John. So we've touched on ion tests a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit about what work is, uh, what kind of work you're doing at the moment with Maxion? So the when I started ion tests, I say you know you scratch beneath the surface, see you or not, there's a scientist lurking under there. And so for me, um, uh, ion tests is a great opportunity to uh, to create a profitable company and to be able to use the proceeds of that. So I said, basically, I, I set the company up without any external funding. I put a little bit of money in to get it started. We were profitable from the start. And so I had the sort of freedom and scope to, to do stuff, you know, uh, obviously not being silly about it, but, you know, enjoy a bit of science. So, uh, and I had this, uh, yeah, such sort of short term, medium term, long term goal, short term, make money from phase display, medium term, develop a mammalian display platform that kept us ahead of the pack, would bring royalties in. And finally, the idea that we would tackle a difficult target class being iron channels, which people have tried for de decades and, and failed with. Um, and we were able to, to get both of those things working. But it also became obvious to me that the knot body, the, the, this ion channel approach, uh, we created a fusion molecule, which we call the knot body. It became obvious to me that the, the model by which we were able to uh, invent it and develop it and generate patents and some assets had taken us as far as we could because the to run to take that further just based on the profits of a service company was never going to work and it also became clear that people who were interested in investing in a drug discovery type company were not interested in a service company and vice versa and so it was obvious the way forward was to to sell the company uh, to sell ion tasks and we separated out the the not body technology into this new company maxion therapeutics uh, which we've now established um, um, in their new office, which is why it looks so Spartan at the Abraham Institute. And I have a, a small group of seven, six or seven people working in the lab. We've managed to pull in an Innovate UK grant. We, from the IONTAS days, have granted patents on the technology and some assets, and we're currently going through a, a fundraise at the moment. Amazing. So 
what is next? So recently you have been awarded um, £1.7 million pounds for a three-year Welcome Trust grant. Can you tell me a little bit more about this project? So this is yeah, yeah, another kind of plate I've got spinning at the moment. <laughs> so, um, so during those IONTAS years, uh, as I say, I had a, a high degree of scope to, to do stuff and I was sort of driven to try and contribute something into the world of anti-venom. So the, there, the current state of the art is you immunize a horse for six or 12 months, you purify the equine antibodies, and then you just inject them into a poor unfortunate in the developing world who's just been bitten by a snake. And if the venom don't get them, the anaphylactic shock of the, the horse, this bolus of 10 grams of horse protein gets them. So I, I felt that there was a, a, an opportunity to maybe give something back or to, you know, to try and begin to forge a path where the benefits of recombinant antibody technology that we've enjoyed in the developed world might eventually find a, a way to help people in the developing world. Um, so while I was in IONTAS, I applied for it. Uh, so actually in the early days, we demonstrated that we could make uh, human antibodies that neutralized the venom of the black mamba and could save mice. Um, I did that at IONTAS under our ticket because I believed that somebody would come along and would fund this properly and I wanted to put a sort of flag in the sand that this is something that we could do so and eventually the Welcome Trust came forth with a 60 or 80 million pound uh, project to, to push uh, anti-venoms forward. I got that grant uh, and, and end up um, I had the grant moved and I'm now setting up at the Department of Medicine at the University of Cambridge um, so we're sitting we're still in the early stages of getting that going, but that's um, another project I'm looking to get going in the next uh, next two or three years. Amazing. And another plate then um, to add to your collection. So um, I'm going to go back now and I want you to imagine that you're an early career seeker. You've just finished your PhD. If you had the same opportunities to do exactly what you've done throughout your career journey, would you do it all again? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, I'm reminded of um, Alan Ashworth, who I worked alongside at the Institute of Cancer Research, which I didn't even mention there. Um, and Alan went on to become director at the Institute of Cancer Research. And in an interview, he was asked the, a similar sort of question, you know, uh, what advice would you give to your uh, to a young person uh, today coming through and actually his his advice was don't take advice from an old fat like me um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'm not sure I, I echo that one but um, but yes I would follow the same journey I, I have to say it took me until I was about 30 uh, I think to arrive at the LMB and for me that was as I say transformational um, it, it might be nicer if I'd got that earlier in my career. It, you know, definitely made a sort of sea change in my outlook and attitude and aspiration. Um, but uh, no, I would I would follow exactly the same path. Thank you so much, John. It really has been a pleasure to to speak to you today, um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I think I could go on for hours and ask you all sorts of questions. But um, thank you so much for joining, no, um, no. and I look forward to seeing what happens next. Thank you very much. Thanks again, and thanks to. One new place once more for the, the award. Hey, bye now.